Welcome to Watershed Community, those of you in the house and those of you online. My name is Cedric Lundy. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Watershed, and this is my daughter, Isla Lundy. And uh, in this, the Oak Within the Acorn series, as you guys already know if you've joined us for the series thus far, we are looking at different children's stories from which we can, you know, get in touch with our inner child, but also just acknowledge and once again see just simple truths that oftentimes in our adulthood we've dismissed. So I was thinking about what story we could do and what's oh no it's on. It's on. This is uh yet again. That's how it is. We'll roll with it. All right. Ha ha. Oh. Now daddy's voice is filling the room. He doesn't have to use his middle school youth pastor voice to fill the room, which he still has. But yeah, so we said, let's look at a children's story, you know, that uh, maybe was dear to us as a child, which, uh, true to the series, I honestly couldn't remember what story was my favorite story as a kid. And someone said, well, what was maybe a favorite story that you enjoyed reading to your daughter? So Isla, when I said this to you and mentioned it to you, what were maybe some of the stories we thought of would be a good story that you really enjoyed having read to you? Go ahead, speak in the mic. Yeah, it's on, it's on, it's on. Yes, it's, it's on. Yep, go ahead, speak. What story? Room in the Broom. Room on the Broom, that's right. Room on the Broom is a story by Julia Donaldson. And uh, she's a favorite author of ours because she also wrote what other book that is a favorite of ours? Has something to do with dogs? Harry McCleary. Mm -hmm. Harry McCleary from Donaldson's Dairy. And that story, even though it was a favorite, it's, it's pretty simple because it's a bunch of dogs taking a walk and then the, the tomcat comes and scares them away and they all go home. So we thought maybe Room on the Broom would be a good story to share with all of you. So we're literally going to read the story. It's been a long time since I read this one to you, isn't it? Yes, she's a little nervous, but it's all good. All right. Room on the Broom. The witch had a cat in a very tall hat and a long ginger hair which she wore in a plait. How the hat cat purred and how the witch grinned as they sat on their broomstick and flew through the wind. But how the witch wailed and how the cat spat when the wind blew so wildly it blew off the hat. Down, cried the witch, and they flew to the ground. They searched for the hat, but no hat could be found. Then out of the bushes on thundering paws, there bounded a dog with the hat in its paws, jaws. He dropped it politely, then eagerly said, as the witch pulled the hat firmly down on her head, I am a dog, as keen as can be. Is there room on the broom for a dog like me? Yes cried the witch, and the dog clambered on. The witch tapped the broomstick, and whoosh, they were gone. Over the fields and the forest they flew, the dog wagged his tail, and the stormy wind blew. The witch laughed aloud and held onto her hat, but away blew the bow from her long ginger plait. Down, cried the witch, and they flew to the ground. They searched for the bow, but no bow could be found. Then out from a tree with an ear-splitting shriek, there flapped a green bird with the bow in her beak. She dropped it politely and bent her head low. Then she said, as the witch tied her plait in a bow, I am a bird, as green as can be. Is there room on the broom for a bird like me? Yes, cried the witch. So the bird fluttered on. The witch tapped her broomstick and whoosh. They were gone. 
Over the reeds and the rivers they flew, the birds shrieked with glee and the stormy wind blew. They shot through the sky to the back of beyond. The witch clutched her bow but let go of her wand. Down, cried the witch, and they flew to the ground. They searched for the wand, but no wand could be found. You sense a pattern happening here? Then all of a sudden, from out of a pond, leapt a dripping wet frog with a dripping wet wand. He dropped it politely, then said with a croak, as the witch dried the wand and a fold on her cloak, I am a frog, as clean as can be. Is there room on the broom for a frog like me? Yes, cried the witch, so the frog bounded on. The witch tapped the broomstick, and whoosh, they were gone. Over the moors and the mountains they flew. The frog jumped for joy, and... <gasps> The broom snapped in two. Down fell the cat and the dog and the frog. Down they went tumbling into a bog. The witch's half broomstick flew into a cloud, and the witch heard a roar that was scary and loud. I am a dragon, as mean as can be, and I'm planning to have witch and chips for my tea. I think the uh, dragon is Scottish. Now, no, cried the witch, flying higher and higher. The dragon flew after her, breathing out fire. Help, cried the witch, flying down to the ground. She looked all around, but no help could be found. The dragon drew near and, licking his lips, said, Maybe this once I'll have witch without chips. But, add, but just as he planned to begin on his feast, from out of a ditch rose a horrible beast. It was tall, dark, and sticky, and feathered and furred. It had four frightful heads. It had wings like a bird. And its terrible voice, when it started to speak, was a yowl and a growl and a croak and a shriek. It dripped in its squelch as it strode from the ditch, and it said to the dragon, Buzz off! That's my witch! The dragon drew back, and he started to shake. I'm sorry, he spluttered. I made a mistake. It's nice to have met you, but now I must fly. And he spread out his wings, and he was off through the sky. Then down flew the bird, and down jumped the frog. Down climbed the cat, and phew, said the dog. And thank you, oh, thank you, the grateful witch cried. Without you, I'd be in that dragon's insides. Then she lifted up her cauldron and said with a grin, find something, everyone, throw something in. So the frog found a lily and the cat found a cone and the bird found a twig and the dog found a bone. They threw them all in and the witch stirred them well. And while she was stirring, she muttered a spell. Iggity, ziggity, zaggity, zoom. Then out rose... A truly magnificent broom with seats for the witch and the cat and the dog, a nest for the bird, and a shower for the frog. Yes, cried the witch, and they all clambered on. The witch tapped the broomstick, and whoosh, they were gone. And that is the story of the room on the broom. You know, just leave it on. Just leave it on. So Isla... This, again, was a favorite story of, of yours and of mine and mummies to read to you as a child. And they even have an animated version as well that you can find on Netflix. That's not a promo for them. But if you want to find it, there it is. So let me ask you, you know, a couple of questions on your thoughts on Room on the Broom. What is your favorite part of the story? My favorite part is the end when they make the broom. Mm -hmm. And I really like it because they all find a random item and just put it in. Mm -hmm. And then it just makes a really nice broom. And right. they all have their own they all have their own thing. Yeah, they all have their own little special accommodations on this broom. It's like mummy, it's like uh, uh, Nana and Papa's uh, uh, camper van. Yeah, which is basically, my parents don't camp. They just relocate. But yeah, they all grab something. Is it like a random something that they find? Or does it have maybe a special significance to each one of the creatures? It's, just, um, it's more like it's something special to them. Right. So if you were like 
there with the witch and the witch had made room for you on the broom and then the broom split in half and then she's like, hey, let's make a new broom. You go grab something, anything. What would be something that you would grab for the witch to throw in the cauldron that would be special to you? Anything colorful. Anything colorful? Is there anything specific that you currently own or possess? Sharpies. Sharpies. About how many Sharpies are in this Sharpie collection? Uh, too many? <laughs> yes, too many. Too many. There's a lot. There's probably about 20 or 30 Sharpies, one in each a different and unique color. And what do those Sharpies and them being so colorful maybe say about you? Um... I love arts and crafts, and I'm very creative and imaginative in what I draw. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. And so that would add on to the, the new broom. So another question, what, what, do you, what do you think the moral of the story is? What's maybe the lesson to be learned from Room on the Broom? That um, I think the moral of it is that everybody's welcome mm. on the broom and um, they come together to help to help each other. Yeah, yeah, that there's room for, for everybody. Why do you think that's like hard in real life for people to make room on their broom? Um, like if something that they like and they have to share it with somebody, mm. they might not really want to share it because it's theirs. Interesting. Yeah, kind of like daddy with his candy. Yeah. yeah, you can say yes. 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 Daddy with his uh, McDonald's french fries. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's other things that daddy shares, just not his candy necessarily, at least not willingly. But daddy will cook for you until the cows come home. Yes, yes. All right, well, Isla, thank you uh, for joining me. It was neat to be able to read this story to everyone, to you, and get some of your thoughts on uh, Room on the Broom. So I know you're really nervous and probably waiting to get back down there, so I release you. <laughs> All right. So yeah, room on the broom. It, it, it's, it's, again, aside from just like the drawings and the story itself, I think this story has a lot of different really simple truths that it doesn't take a rocket science to, to, to figure it out or some theologian to maybe see some of the deeper, deeper themes. But I've, I've jotted a couple down. Um, that really stand out to me about this story of this witch and her room on the broom and all these creatures that join her on the broom uh, that just kind of share some of these thoughts and these things that really jumped out to me and then also connect those to things that we see uh, in the scriptures. Um, and I've totally left uh, my phone down there that had some scripture references. So I was going to make a joke about how in Micah uh, 5.12, it says something about how witchcraft is to be condemned. And I'm going to tear down all your places of witchcraft and uh, things that say about, um, you know, getting rid of all the witches. But, you know, fortunately, we have a different understanding of maybe witches and witchcraft. And we see that even represented in the witch herself, it, especially if you ever watch the animated version of one where she is just this individual who is really connected to nature and has an appreciation of nature in all of nature all of the created beings not just creation itself but there's never any question to her whether or not she's going to make room on the broom for the dog despite the fact that usually we tend to think of cats and dogs not getting along and even in fact in the animated one what's kind of humorous in it is the cat continues to be continues to become more and more exasperated with the witch continuing to make room on the broom for these different creatures that the cat is constantly side eyeing the other animals and rolling its eyes whenever uh, one of these other stray animals comes up but also one of the things that maybe isn't as clear or obvious about um, 
uh, the story when you read it on the page that they uh, give more life to and energy to in the animated version is that each and every one of these animals are isolated and alone. That you have this dog that is by itself, just this random dog in the woods, no owner, no other dogs to be found. And it doesn't hesitate to ask, do you have room on the broom for me? That it's not just an ask of like, do you have room so I can have this experience of soaring through the wind and the wind going through my fur because we know how much dogs like to stick their heads out of car windows, but also just this literal asking, do you have space for me to come alongside you in whatever journey that you're taking, that you have this frog who lives in this bog. It's this dirty place or this pond with, with water and dirt and mud, and yet the first thing the frog communicates about itself is that it is as clean as can be. That in the animated version, it has these other frogs off to the side who are in the mud, in the water. They're not afraid to get dirty, and they're just looking at this other guy like, dude, what's wrong with you? Hop on in. The water's fine. And so he's like an outcast amongst the rest of these frogs. And even the bird, it's a green bird. And it shows that the green bird is born amongst a bunch of other birds that are, in fact, not green. And that bird becomes the outcast. And that the first kind of theme that I see within there is that oftentimes we don't necessarily fit in in the places where we think we would naturally fit. That oftentimes the community that we try to build is built around affinity. But sometimes the kind of community that lasts is the kind of community where we gather around because we actually make space for someone who brings something to our lives that is different than what we already have. That it's not about being around people all the time who have the same interests and hobbies and that are just like us. But oftentimes life becomes more richer when we actually make room for people who aren't anything like us. So in the scriptures, we see this in Jesus' invitation of specifically the 12 disciples. That amongst them, you have fishermen. You have a zealot who, a zealot in that time, Simon the Zealot, would have been this individual who was not only opposed to Israel being ruled by Rome, but was actually someone who would have taken the sword to basically try to remove the presence of the Roman Empire from their lives that this was a person who was ready to do war, to do battle with the powers of empire. And yet also amongst them was Matthew the tax collector, who, if you're doing the math, who is he collecting taxes for? He's collecting taxes for the Roman government. So here amongst Jesus' disciples, you have a zealot, and someone who literally represents the Roman Empire. And yet, Jesus makes room for the both of them to not just simply be his disciples, but to literally live life together. To go on this journey together. This journey that lasts longer than just the time that they're with Jesus before the death and, and, and resurrection of Jesus and the ascension. That their investment in one another went way beyond just that time that they had with Jesus. A real bond uh, was formed. So couple of things also about this story that really stands out to me that I find interesting is that uh, the witch has to lose something first. 
Every time before she actually meets one of these other creatures, she has to lose something. And how often when we talk about things like inclusion, do we fail to remember or recognize that oftentimes in order to be the quote inclusive kind of people that we aspire to be, it oftentimes requires that we lose something in the process to be able to include another person. In particular, a person who is different from us or represents something that the community that we were born in, raised in, where we have an affinity, has said that that is not good, that that is not appropriate, that that person or that individual is ain't living right. And you need to be careful of associating with those kind of people. Or those kind of people represent an ideology or political slant that we don't necessarily agree with and thus we have to keep our distance. I think one of the things that I've just observed oftentimes is maybe the younger generation doesn't fully appreciate that what comes so naturally for them when it comes to inclusion, for many of us of older generations, we literally had to lose some things. And I'm not saying that that should uh, uh, be an excuse for us not to be willing to let go or sacrifice those things, but maybe what would be in order is a little bit more grace. Because how many of us, to become the kind of inclusive people that we are today, we have lost family. We have lost friends. Maybe even employment. The holidays are right around the corner, which for many people is just going to be this painful reminder that gathering with people that they have gathered with most of their lives just isn't going to happen or it's not anywhere near the same way it used to be. And yet, including people, oftentimes, regardless, it requires oftentimes loss, whether it be uh, something that we willingly give up, something that we sacrifice or is taken from us, or, as in the story, how often was the wind the instigator of the losing of these items and thus the instigator of these meetings? And oftentimes in Scripture, the wind is synonymous with the Spirit of God. That maybe in our deconstruction, we've lost an all for uh, making space, making room, if you will, for the work of the Spirit in instigating a movement towards making space in our lives for other people and things. That let's not discount even in the midst of our deconstructing really bad and toxic theology around the working of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, let's not take it for granted that, that maybe, just maybe, the Spirit is still up to something. And it is instigating good things. That it is instigating beautiful things. That it is instigating something new. The thing that uh, they, being the animals in the witch, uh, were united around isn't necessarily what brought them uh, together. That though they're united around riding this broom, again, the thing that brought them together was their being isolated, their being alone, and their desire for community. Y'all, we have, in essence, lost two years of our communal lives. I was talking to uh, a good friend who they're, they're about to move, and we were just uh, kind of grieving how we really haven't 
uh, taken advantage of, of getting together as much as we would like in the time that we've known each other. And I just said to the friend, dude, like, at, like as much as it would have been great, like we've, we've lost two years. Let's not beat ourselves up about the fact that we didn't get together these past two years in the way that we would like to. That, <clears throat> excuse me, we can still uh, redeem that time, that we can still uh, find ways to be uh, united together because our connection to one another goes deeper than just being in the same places at the same time. That part of what really creates community um, is also just pursuing one another despite differences, uh, despite literal distance and physical proximity. Um, the broom breaks. <laughs> the broom breaking represents this disruption, and that's exactly what we've had, is a disruption. And yet, what happens, right? These animals, they get together, they go and they rescue the witch. They don't let the disruption of that dragon be the end of the story. What are the dragons? What are those things that have been a disruption beyond just this pandemic that we are living in that is getting in the way of us making room in our lives for other people? Whatever that might be. And are we willing to overcome whatever those disruptions are. You had a wee little man named Zacchaeus who despite the fact <laughs> that he is completely disconnected from his community has this great curiosity in who this Jesus is and wants to see him for himself. And despite the fact that he is short, so short that it is really difficult for him to see over the crowd, he does not let that disruption get in the way that he's willing to actually climb this tree. He doesn't let the disruption of the fact that literally anyone who sees him, they're not going to be necessarily gracious enough to let him through and let the short guy come on through and, 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 and get up to the front where he can see, right? You can see it. I can imagine them seeing oh, here comes Zacchaeus. Let's, let's squeeze a little bit closer together so he can't get in to see. And yet, even despite those disruptions, even despite those obstacles, he goes ahead and he climbs the tree so that he can perhaps get a glimpse of Jesus. And on the other side, Jesus, yet again, representing that not being unwilling to lose something, shouts at Zacchaeus and says, hey, I'm coming over to your house for dinner. Which, what's the response even in that story? People start moaning that here's Jesus going to the house of a sinner. That Jesus is not allowing the perception of other people and what they think to prevent him from reaching out to another person who could really use a friend. And then, of course, the end of the story, they all contribute something uh, to creating a new and better uh, than ever broom. That this story in Scripture that we have, again, and I've probably beat this dead horse and resuscitated it so I can beat it again. But the end of the story is this new heavens and this new earth that God takes what is already here and present and he doesn't destroy it. He uses what is already there. God, the divine, uses what is already there and creates something new. And that we get this picture in Revelation of the glory and the honor of the nations entering into the new Jerusalem, the new city. That it's again this picture of, that's very similar to these animals going and grabbing something that is special and unique to them and bringing it and all of those things going into the cauldron and creating something new, something better. 
that that's the story that we're invited into. So the question for us becomes, in a lot of ways, do we have room on our broom? Do we have room in whatever our proverbial brooms are to make space for fellow outcasts, to make space for fellow wanderers and lost souls? Or are we going to be like the rich young ruler who is willing to do all the things, check all the boxes, that gives him the status or the access that he desires? Yet when Jesus says, that's great, that's awesome, now... Give up your possessions and come follow me. Maybe, just maybe, what the rich young ruler wasn't willing to give up wasn't the possessions. Perhaps what the rich young ruler wasn't willing to give up was his status to the point of following and journeying with a ragtag group of disciples with this rabbi that most people didn't know what to make of that is being bankrolled by women. Like in first century Israel, that's not the kind of status that this rich young ruler would have had. That would have been a step down for him. Because he could have easily probably sold his possessions. And if their society was anything like ours, he's probably well networked. Where he'd be well taken care of. All that being said, watershed. Hits you with a lot of very random thoughts. But here's one really specific one. Again, in the midst of this pandemic, and not just the pandemic, but the political climate of the last four years, this community has lost a number of things. Whether it be a feeling of safety, whether it be literally some of these empty seats, some of these empty chairs represents people, perhaps, who are no longer part of this community. And we don't have time to get into the reasons why and the motivations why. But that also means that each one of these chairs represents new people who are going to come into this community. And one of the things that we need to be able to do is to make room and make space for those people, not just in these chairs, but also out there. It's really easy to leave spaces that have been vacated in our lives empty and vacant. But are we willing to make space for new people? Because one of the things that I know I've lost from when I was a child is my ability just to be curious enough about another person to create space for them to enter my life. Res work, responsibilities, accountability, trying to read people, all those things have gotten in my way of being able to be like the witch who just simply says, yes, hop on my broom. Experience the rushing wind blowing through your hair or across your slimy reptilian skin, like the frog. So, let me say a quick word and the band will do what the band does. Heavenly Father, thank you. <clears throat> that you, <laughs> that you represent this idea 
of making room on the broom, that you represent this idea of making space, of being willing to lose something, to give up something in Christ. Of whom Paul writes and reminds us, and may this be an example for us to make room for in our individual and collective imagination so that we can create something new as well. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Having this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of the Father, God the Father, who is making all things new. In Jesus' name, amen.